Okay, right. Ionization, convection factors, and cloudy. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to present a, an ongoing project that uh, aims to, to provide the community uh, a set of ionization correction factors for planetary nebulae and H2 regions. This is a work that I'm doing with uh, many collaborators. Most of them, I hope that they are here now. Um, well, we all know that uh, ionized nebulae provide us uh, useful information about nucleosynthesis processes, the, the production of elements in stars, and also about uh, chemical evolution of galaxies. Uh, H2 regions trace the present uh, abundance of the interstellar medium, whereas planetary nebulae uh, reflect the abundances of the interstellar medium in the past. Uh, we have heard uh, a lot about the different methods to calculate chemical abundances, so I just want to remind uh, these uh, three different ways to derive them. First, if we have uh, deep spectra uh, and we can measure uh, several lines, we can calculate the ionic abundances of various ions and then uh, add them up to, to obtain the total abundance. If we cannot see all the ions, we then use the ionization correction factor. Another way um, uh, is to use the uh, strong line methods that uh, we have heard uh, from Grassina. And then we can also uh, fit a model to our observations to derive the abundances. But here we also need uh, to have a good spectra because we need to have uh, several uh, restriction constraints to, to, to fit uh, our model. I'm going to focus only on the first one. And just to remind again, um, from our observations, we derive the ionic abundances of uh, all the ions that we observe from uh, one element, and we use the ionization correction factors to take into account the contribution of the ions that we do not observe. Uh, the first uh, ionization correction factors that uh, were proposed were the empirical ionization correction factors, and they were based on similarities between ions of different elements. Um, they were proposed by Manuel, Rafael, Silvia, and many others. And uh, I saw here uh, three examples that some of them are still used nowadays. Uh, but we know from models from many years ago that these uh, simple relations are not always correct. I present here a plot of the ionic uh, fraction of neon plus plus as a function of oxygen plus plus. And we can see that if we, we use this simple relation, our derived abundances may not be correct. Uh, here is the, the dots are uh, a grid of photoionization models that I'm going to tell more um, later in a minute. Uh, here is uh, the same plot, but for nit nitrogen over oxygen ratio. So uh, the case is better than the previous one, but again, uh, we have to take care when using this uh, abundance ratio. So the, the, west, the best way to calculate ionization correction factors is using photoionization models. Here I list some uh, papers, some works that uh, provide ionization correction factors for planetary nebulae and H2 regions using a grid of uh, photoionization models. Here I should mention that um, Although it is better to use photoionization models, we always depend on the atomic physics that is included, included in, the, in the models. So if, if the atomic physics change, or uh, yes, if it is changed, uh, then we, our photoionization models are going to be different and our uh, results uh, are going to be different too. So our general aim is uh, to provide a complete set of ionization correction factors and uh, the associated uncertainties to this uh, ICS uh, suitable to be used in planetary nebulae and in H2 regions. I'm going to talk a bit uh, about uh, a work that was published uh, a few years ago. Uh, here is the uh, 3MDB, the Mexican Million Database, model database that uh, uh, it was constructed by Christophe, and this is the, the home 
and you can download uh, any of the different uh, grid of models and use them and, and do whatever you want. Uh, and this is the, the page that explains, explains uh, the, the grid plan sustainability 2014, that is the one that we use to, to, to propose new ionization correction factors for plan sustainability. You can see all the details here and also in, the, in our paper. So uh, the idea is that uh, we want to have a large uh, grid of models that cover a wide range of physical parameters. So here are listed all the parameters. And we, we use black bodies and also Rauch atmospheres. Uh, we calculated radiation and uh, matter-bounded models. We use several uh, set of chemical abundances. And we computed models with dust and uh, without dust. But uh, we also want to have a realistic grid of models. So we applied some selection criteria to the whole grid of, mod of models in order uh, to, to be more representative of the real observed uh, planet sustainability. So for example, we exclude um, those models having uh, nebular masses uh, beyond one solar masses, or those that don't have a surface brightness in agreement with the values observed in the literature, or the models that have a high density and a low inner ratio. Uh, and, and we also take into account the, the evolutionary tracks, some evolutionary tracks. So we, we only use the models that fit uh, these, uh, these tracks. So I'm going to, to explain just uh, one case, because I don't want to bore you so much. Uh, so uh, here is the, the, the case for carbon over oxygen. Uh, this is the kind of plots that we have. Here are our models of plant enabling, and we perform a fit, and we uh, provide the, the analytical expression for that fit. And what it is important that, that is that we also provide the, the range of validity of our fit. So for example, if you have a, an object uh, with very low degree of, uh, of ionization or very high, uh, we don't recommend you to, to use our fit to obtain the, the disabundance ratio. And also, uh, together with the fits, we also provide uh, analytical expressions for the uncertainties associated with our fit. So for example, here are the index, the uncertainty uh, that you are going to have in your final uh, abundance ratio if you use our uh, ionization correction factor. For uh, objects with low degree of ionization is a plus minus 0.1 dex. And uh, for higher ionization objects, you, you have a lower uncertainty. Uh, the important thing here is the, that tab this table. Uh, you may go to the table three on the paper, and here you have uh, the, the, the things that you are going to use. The analytical expressions for the ionization correction factors of helium, oxygen, nitrogen, neon, sulfur, chlorine, argon, and carbon. We also provide the, the analytical expressions for the uncertainties and the ranges of validity for all our ionization correction factors. So now we have uh, good ionization correction factors. Uh, we want to use them no? to do some astrophysics. Uh, I'm going to, to talk about uh, two recent work that, um, th in which we, we used our own ionization correction factors. Um, here, uh, we, we wanted to, to explore if low mass stars can produce some oxygen uh, in, the, in their nucleus and transport the oxygen to the surface so we can observe this enrichment in the planetary nebula phase. So we selected um, a sample of planetary nebulae and H2 region to compare. Uh, they were, uh, they are located, all of them, in the neighborhood, uh, in the solar neighborhood. So the gradient doesn't uh, affect our results. And to have a, an idea of the progenitor masses, we use a spitzer spectra. Because in this spectra, we can detect some dust features that uh, tell us about the progenitor mass. Because, uh, well, we, we divide the sample in two classes. The, those having uh, oxygen-rich dust, 
for example, uh, crystalline and amorphous silicates, and those haven't carbon-rich dust, for example, uh, the feature of uh, silicon carbide. Uh, as we have heard uh, yesterday, I think, uh, the, the, the type of dust that we uh, found in, in planetary nebulae are related with the C over O uh, abundance ratio that was in the atmosphere of the progenitor star. And this uh, defines the, 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 the type of dust that, that the star is going to form. <laughs> no? uh, and the, the value of this C over O uh, ratio uh, came from the mass of the progenitor. Um, for example, if the star has uh, C over O below one, we expect them to be uh, to have a mass below 1.5 solar masses or uh, above three solar masses. This is due to the nucleosynthesis processes occurring in the star. Uh, if we have a planetary nebula with carbon-rich dust and also with a carbon uh, over oxygen uh, above one, then we expect uh, the star to have a mass between 1.5 and 3 solar masses. So the point here is that using a Spitzer spectra, we can classify the planetary nebulae according to the dust features, and this is related to the mass of the progenitor. Then we, we can separate the, the sample in, in a different uh, population. No? So here we have the oxygen over chlorine ratio versus the oxygen abundances. If oxygen and and chlorine are uh, produced in the same stars, in the stars with the same masses, then we expect to have here a um, constant uh, value of this ratio uh, as a fun function of the metallicity. What we see is that uh, H2 regions and the planetary nebulae with oxygen-rich dust uh, present an almost constant ratio, although we have some dispersion, but we, ha we have a group here those planetary nebulae with carbon-rich dust, and then with a progenitor mass in this range, and they have a higher oxygen over chlorine ratio. This can only be explained if oxygen has been produced in the star and then transport to the surface, and then we are seeing this enrichment in the planetary nebulae uh, phase. So this is the first observational uh, evidence of oxygen production in low mass stars in our uh, galaxy. Uh, this enrichment is predicted at lower metallicities, but in our galaxy uh, it shouldn't be. The other result that I want to talk about is this one. Uh, we were studying uh, iron and nickel abundances. These elements are, uh, have uh, similar chemical and physics properties, so we expect them uh, to, to be depleted in the grains in a similar way. These, these elements are refractory elements, so they are mainly deposited on the grains, not in the gas. So we, went, we wanted to study uh, if the depletion factor of these elements is similar or not. Uh, we, for, for, for this, we derived a new ionization correction factor for nickel because uh, there were no ionization correction factors uh, before. And then we calculate uh, the abundances in, the, in a sample of planetary nebulae. And uh, here I show the, the iron over nickel abundance ratio versus the depletion factor of the nickel. What we can see here is that at lower depletion factors, when almost all the nickel atoms are in the gas and not in the dust, the value of this ratio for these planetary nebulae are almost solar. But when we go to higher depletion factors, when the nickel and the iron are mostly condensed, condensed in the grains, then uh, this ratio increases. This is telling us that although th these two elements are similar, and in, in principle they have similar depletion factor, uh, at higher depletion, nickels tend to be more attached into the grains than iron. And this is also a, a new uh, result. So uh, some things that we are doing and we want to explore more, uh, we are calculating with our grid of, uh, of models, we are calculating a new ionization correction factors. Alexia uh, presented a poster uh, about sodium, but we have uh, 
the intention of calculate uh, ionization correction factors for a lot of more elements. And we also want to explore what can we say uh, for H2 regions. We, we have in, in the database of Christoph, we have some read, uh, the one uh, of Khalifa and the other one of Bond, that are grids uh, of H2 regions that we want to explore and, and see if we can do, uh, if we can say something about the ionization correction factors we use in this grid. But um, we also have the aim to construct a, a grid of models uh, similar to the one that we calculated for plant in uh, a grid that covers a, a wide range of parameters, of physical parameters, and then uh, do the same uh, procedure. So, in summary, wake up. Um, I just want to, to emphasize that uh, we need to have reliable abundances to, to gain some information about the nucleosynthesis processes, processes in the stars and also to know uh, more about galactic, chemical galactic evolution. And to do this, we need high quality observations, but we also need ionization correction factors that are reliable. And to do this, we need reliable photo ionization models. And to do this, we need cloudy. So therefore, uh, thank you, Gary, and all the people that are involved in the uh, development of cloudy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Gloria. You actually have some minutes left if you want to say anything yeah. else. No, I, I just <laughs> wanted to say something that is not related with the talk. Um, it was a great pleasure to participate in this conference and also in the organization. Although now I'm a bit tired, but <laughs> I am happy to be here and to participate in this. Okay, so we have plenty of time for some questions. So. The, this whole thing is built on this atomic database, which is a, a very shifting sands. It's, it really is updated from year to year. You have to go all the way back and redo the whole thing. When, well, for instance, uh, there's a recent Badnell paper that updated the sulfur three to two dielectronic recombination rate mm -hmm. to change it by about a factor of two. Would that mean you have to go back and and redo everything? That would well, be a lot we, of work. Uh, we at first time. Uh, at the beginning of the project, we used uh, Cloud 10 version, I think. And, but Christophe, who is the one running those uh, models, uh, constructed the, the whole machine. So if Cloud changes the version and the atomic physics, we just have to run the models again and yeah, perform the, the ionization correction factors. But it depends on the change, because maybe some of them are not going to affect our results. Maybe you could add the million, uh, million model database to the test suite of Cloudy. Mm -hmm. Run it every night. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, I have a short question. You, you mentioned that you have models with dust and without dust, and then you were talking about carbon-rich versus oxygen-rich. Nebuli, do you distinguish between carbon grains and silicate grains, and would that make any difference? In the grid of models? Yes. For the models with dust, I think we just uh, include like typical plant nebulae, which I really don't know. Uh, maybe they are carbon rich, but uh, but uh, for the ionization correction factors, no no di no difference. Okay, let's uh, thank Gloria again. A small comment for people speaking Spanish: Gloria is tired, but she will present the mm. conference that will be. Uh, given uh, tonight at 7 in this uh, same uh, place for public. So there will be a huge queue outside, 500 more people waiting to for this conference. It's one, one per, per, per month. It's not always Gloria. Eh? No. <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are running. <laughs> and, uh, so if, if you, you want to, to assist this conference, please uh, ask me to reserve you a, a place. Otherwise, you will, you will be an, an outside with a, a secondary screen. So. Thanks, Christoph. There'll be a short pause while we change over the speaker.
on the computer. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Stavros Akras. He's going to talk to us about low ionization emission loans in shock excited and photoionized regions. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stavros Akras, and I'm coming from Brazil. Yes, indeed. It's better to be here than in uh, the Olympic Games. <laughs> For me, at least. So, I'm going to talk about low ionization emission lines in shock excited and photoionized regions. Uh, usually, we can detect uh, low ionization uh, emission lines in different environments like uh, galaxies, the famous liners, photodissociation photo regions, planetary nebulae. And <coughs> we know several speakers mentioned about the PPT diagrams for spectral classification. Uh, but also we can use this for a planetary nebulae. Here, you, opa, sorry, oh, classic. Uh, here, the red dots are pl uh, planetary nebulae, H2 regions, a supernova remnants. <laughs> but uh, the planetary nebulae people prefer to use the SMB diagnostic diagram from Sabadin and collaborators. Here you see planetary nebulae, the red dots, they cover and wide range of values, sorry. The, here is the H alpha over nitrogen two ratio, H alpha over uh, sulfur two ratio. Uh, here we have the low excitation planetary nebulae and up, up there the high excitation nebulae. On the other hand, there the blue points are supernova remnants and they cover a specific regime because of two uh, criteria. However, these yellow uh, triangles are young supernova remnants. And we see that they are going even more down to higher uh, nitrogen to emission. This can be explained from new generation uh, shock models from who, if I'm saying correctly, 2004, who shows that higher expansion velocity, higher shock velocities Pro, uh, is, um, produce stronger low ionization lines. From 100, if you cannot see, here is 300 uh, kilometers per second. Okay, so we have on the same region, planetary nebulae, photoionized objects, and supernova remnants, shock excited. One group of planetary nebulae we can find here is are the highly evolved planetary nebulae or generally old planetary nebulae. Uh, this, group of, this group of objects are usually low excited because they are old and big, type 1, and they show high n n nitrogen 2 and uh, sulfur 2 over H alpha line ratios, but also they show high uh, oxygen 1, neutral lines, oxygen 1 over H alpha and nitrogen 1 over H alpha line ratios. One, one, mem uh, one member of this, of this group is um, Abel 14, which is almost uh, 20 years old. Uh, the nitrogen to a sulfur 2 lines can be reproduced from a poor photoionized model, but the neutral lines, the neutral lines cannot. So probably there is a mix between photoionization mechanism and shocks. Another object is this one. Uh, again, it's very old. It has the same um, uh, characteristics, strong nitrogen to a sulfur two, strong nitrogen, oxygen one, and nitrogen one. But these people, alien collaborators, they used, mock, I think they used uh, map, uh, mapping, I think, I don't remember. To reproduce the whole spectra, they should uh, assume also a shock of only 25 kilometer per second. And this is because of the interaction with the interstellar medium. So what we see from this analysis that low, ions, low velocity shocks can enrich, can en um, result in an enhancement of neutral uh, emission lines. But at the, other at the other side, fast velocity shocks affect both singly ionized lines and neutral lines. So we have to take into account every time the, the, the shocks. 
Besides this, besides this uh, high velocity, uh, high, uh, highly evolved flying by nebulae, low ionization emission lines can be found in small scales, small scale structures in planetary nebulae embedded. And here you can see three examples. Uh, the red color corresponds to the nitrogen two emission. Uh, from now on, I'm gonna say I'm gonna call these structures as LISs, low ionization structures, and I'm going to refer to the rim, cells, and the surrounding medium as a nebular component. To study this and to understand why they emit strong low ionization lines, we, we got a sample of five planetary nebulae with low ionization structures. Uh, we extracted spectra from different regions, and we analyzed this, uh, this data. We found that there is no difference in chemical abundance between low ionization structures and nebular components. Here is uh, nitrogen over oxygen and uh, nitrogen uh, ab uh, abundance. The blue points uh, correspond to the nebular components, and the red or green correspond to low ionization structures. If we compare the electron temperature, we do not get any difference. We think the errors they show the same uh, electron temperature. But so what, what, what is going on? Why they are so different in, in low ionization structures? If we check the term in the electron density, we usually see, we found that the low ionization structures, they have lower electron density than the surrounding medium. So what is the answer here? Because most of the 